No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and today I bring you the one and only DJ Drama. What's up, man? This a is a real, long time in the making. A real one, right here. <laughs> do, okay, do you remember the experience that I'm going to bring up that we had in Atlanta? So I remember you be coming to Mean Streets. Um, I remember you being at the studio, but no, I don't remember the per the right. experience. But beyond that, so I was out there in Atlanta with Shoreline Mafia. Yeah, yeah, and. I just remember that you were doing an interview with them, uh -huh. and there was something that they all had to say, and I kind of can't remember what it was, but it might have been like, it was like a gangster girl's tagline or oh, like, something. Oh, uh, like they were doing their drop for the show or something? Yeah, like, and one of the dudes <laughs> in Trailer Mafia, one of the a little lesser known guys of it, but he was not trying to say it, and you were not feeling it at all. So I'm kind of just sitting there watching this play out, just like, oh, man, this is fucking crazy. Damn. Do you remember what it was? I I, I vaguely remember that, but I don't remember what the what the scenario could have been. I don't remember exactly what it was. Like, what is it that he could have, that I would have wanted him to say that he didn't want to say? I was combing my brain last night trying to remember. Damn. But it wasn't anything that was like a big deal. It was just like some little drop or something yeah. that you wanted everybody to do, uh -huh. and you weren't feeling it. I think I do kind of vaguely remember this now. And I just, I, <laughs> yeah. I had to check in with one of my homies last night. I'm like, that really happened, right? I didn't like invent that in my head. I I do. I now that you bring it up, I do vaguely remember that happening. But more more, I'm gonna be honest with you. More importantly, what I remember about that is you being at the studio and me not sparking more of of conversation with you mm. as I should have. Like, I don't think I at that moment I was as aware of and obviously this is what like six seven years ago so clearly five maybe but yeah uh, okay it's, been a, while. it's yeah. been a while so clearly you've come a long way since then but you were still you know who you are and i i look back on it like damn why didn't i make more conversation with adam at the time and just kind of like that's funny dive in and like you know just chop it up and you know I, get to know him a little more i was thinking about that too because you know i was hanging out with these rappers drinking some smoking some <laughs> And a lot of times that has happened to me in my life where I was like kind of – and I don't get loaded like that anymore, but where I think back and I'm like, damn, when you was at that party and you ran into that guy, you really should have talked to him more, but you were right. feeling a little too good right. at the time. You didn't really like you know, enable it. You know? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but again, you know – you were one of the legendary people to come through Mean Street Studios, and then like I just vaguely remember that I have this image of like you in the kitchen, and then <laughs> kind of afterwards, kind of like, oh yeah, that's the guy that did so and so and so and so and so and so, and I was like, damn, like you know, because I'm 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 one that you know I like I'm I'm a student of the culture, so mm. I I love this type of conversation, and you know, you obviously been doing your thing for some time, so well, it's crazy yeah. just because I mean I've been listening to you since I was such a young guy. And it was such like a that the mixtape era really like kind of breathed life into hip hop mm, for me at yeah. that time, especially mm. because I moved to New York in 2004. Okay, w at the height of you know G Facts. Unit mixtapes, Dipset right. mixtapes, yeah. And then you were someone who was like clearly like injecting this like Southern yeah. as well mm. into what we were all like buying from the corner store and yeah, everything. Absolutely. And looking back on that, it's just like. I don't know. And, and to see the way that you've actually managed to continue to mm. switch your hustle up, mm -hmm. continue to do incredibly well for yourself, to, uh, accomplish new accolades that you might not have ever imagined mm. earlier on in your career. I mean, it's been pretty unbelievable to, for to witness. Sure. Um, it's been unbelievable to experience and to go through this journey. Like if somebody would have told me when I first started DJing or, you know, going into even the conception of gangster grills that we would be sitting here today talking about things that I've accomplished. I would have never believed them. Like, mm. you know, it's, it, it, it's like, it's, it's mind blowing. And then what's even more mind blowing is like being here in 2023 and being at this point where arguably I'm kind of like the hottest I've ever been in my career or, or, you know, comparable to, when I was on fire in 06 with Wayne and Jeezy and, and Tip and so forth, and I have so much legacy behind me. So, you know, to be in this space at going on 45 this year, like, is is pretty f unbelievable, bro. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, that's incredible, honestly. And it's very inspiring as well just because, you know, I've had so many different hustles in my life. And sometimes when I talk about my life, people are – I almost feel like people think I'm lying because I'm, like, just describing <laughs> 
that I was doing hustling when I was 19 and they're yeah. just looking at me now like that doesn't even sound right what the <laughs> you doing that I'm like I was a very different person at that point right. in my life but you've just been able to sort of flip between yeah. that shit I mean it's, it's been something that like like I'm I'm very conscious of like you know like early on in my career when I first got on like you know to me it was like even through the you know I started DJing 92 you know I I pretty much feel like I got on around what like oh three oh four. That's when I really started to, to see some some real money and like Gangsta Grills was becoming a, a, a notable brand. <clears throat> so even during those years, like when I first got hot, I was like, all right, like how do I, I got to maintain this? Like you know, I, I envision longevity in a sense of like not even knowing that I would be sitting here today with a Grammy, with a multi million dollar successful record label, with all these accolades under me, but just knowing like you know that the, the the easy part, even though it's hard as fuck and still not easy to do, is to get here but to maintain it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, and I'm I'm big on manifestation, you know what I mean? Like just putting things out into the universe. So, um, yeah, to sit here, like I I, I challenge myself a lot. I'm very like thankful and you know humble about everything that i've done but i'm also like all right what what i'm gonna do next like what, what can i do next yeah because like the, seeing you be able to switch between all of these different hustles it's like it kind of makes me think about youtube in a way because with youtube it's like i've been grinding at this shit for over 10 years mm -hmm. and sometimes even still to this day i look at life a little bit too much judged by my youtube analytics you know mm -hmm. which is really like that's mm -hmm. not the long run mm -hmm. the long run of business is creating other uh revenue streams that go alongside your content or whatever mm -hmm. and those aren't accounted for within the analytics or whatever and right. sometimes i think you've really allowed the the graph that you've been looking at every day for 10 12 mm -hmm. years you've allowed that to mm -hmm. kind of like embed itself into your sense of importance too much yeah but when i was watching you on a, a math office shit last yeah. night shout out to math shout out to math it really stood out to me like you're a dude who's had to like switch up how you judge how good a job you're doing at your career mm -hmm. over and over and over yeah um yeah i mean you know the game is constantly changing and like you know um hip hop turning 50 like we're in a time and a space where um a, a, a older generation can definitely coexist but we through time like hip hop has always been somewhat of a young man sport mm -hmm. you know and I've like I came in as a mixtape DJ and like you know the mixtape game ha went through a period where you know it started to diminish and you know what i'm saying I, I went to a period when you know I, I wanted to put i put out records and was an artist in my own self and then you know becoming an a r and getting behind other artists so you know some of it is like kind of kind of reinvention in a way and some of it just kind of happened organically like just being able to be a a, a man of many hats no pun intended but um once you i feel like like and and you just touched on it like you know once you kind of build a brand it's like okay how do you create other streams of revenue around that you know what i'm saying so you know once obviously dj drama was a brand or gangster girls was a brand it's like all right what can i do that you know with with that that i've built to continue and to rise and to get money over here and and you know do this venture and and x y and z so but you do, know i learned with tom do you ever feel like there's a tricky balance between like the companies that you're building and then you because obviously selling your services whether it's you hosting a tape or you doing a dj set or you whatever it's like but then at the same time you're building companies mm -hmm. it's sometimes i'm in a position where it's like i need to not be grabbing every single bag that i can get as an individual mm -hmm. and i need to be focused on what i'm doing with my brands and what i'm building with the brands in the long run and sometimes they feel like they're pretty different things they're mm -hmm. going to lead you in very different directions yeah um well one thing for me obviously is that you know um, from a company standpoint or definitely from a label standpoint like it's myself it's don cannon it's lake show so i have partners so we're we all are able to play our roles and I guess in a sense, like partially of what my role is in the label is like being that spotlight, like that attraction to, you know, want to be a part of Generation Now in, in a sense. And, you know, some of like the legacy of, of what Gangster Grills is, is is somewhat 
and has been attractive to artists that have come to the label. Um, so, like, you know, for a, a time in a in a in a certain space and period, like a couple of years ago, like I wasn't even in this 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 role that I'm in right now where I'm doing multiple gangster grills and I'm all over the place and you know like I got a, a bunch of stuff going on like I was kind of comfortable in somewhat of the executive role in running the label and kind of taking a backseat and then you know the opportunity somewhat presented itself for me to like okay like turn up and go into another gear and it's like you know, in this game, in this day and time, when in this game, like you never know when that opportunity's not going to be there, so you got to take full advantage of it. But it's like two very different things of putting together hit records with a bunch of different artists and like making that happen versus like finding young undiscovered talent, right? And then building them up from the ground up. You probably have a higher um, percentage than most people in this game, but mm -hmm. we all know that this is kind of a low percentage thing for the most part. For sure. You know, anyone who runs a label, you're going to sign 10 artists and for maybe sure. one or two are going to become successful. Like, was, was that kind of a interesting transition for you? I mean, I, I want to say, like, you know, like, it was, it, we was gifted in a way because, you know, one of our first artists we signed, being Little Uzi, mm. literally was out the gate a fucking superstar, so it was like, you know, but it also, it came with some pressures too, because it was like, all right, you know, for so long, the pressure had been like being a part of so many other people's careers and successes. And then, all right, having to do it like under our, you know, our label or under our name, you know what I mean? And then we did it and it was like, all right, you got to do it again, mm. you know? And then we were successful at it with Jack in the same vein and again you know he's a, become like a generational artist obviously who's going to be here for a long time so um there's there's some pressures in it for sure you know but you know i take those on like you you got to work with the pressure you know what i mean you can't fold on, uh, under it obviously and it's just like yeah um for us definitely you know we we like to take quality over quantity but at the same time like yeah i want to i want to go out there and sign like five six seven more artists this year mm -hmm. and you know you know see where where we go with them and 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 create some more superstars so um it's obviously a different different entity or different battle than being able to call little wayne and get a verse for a record on my album you know what i'm saying like you know like you said it's a it's a low percentage game like especially today where it's like, you know, there's artists left and right and there's so many different avenues and analytics and places and spaces for people to be and to become. But, you know, if you, if you love it, like, and, and it's something that I do, it's like, Hey, like run it up. Do you think that you having your own thing going is like critical to you being able to sign all these successful artists? Cause when I was going through your, your history and I'm looking at because you were with Atlantic before, right? I was originally, and, and you signed a bunch of artists who I, I remember their names from back in the day and everything. Nothing against them, but maybe you know it seems like your track record has improved since then. Because you have like massive superstars since then. Well, I never really. I ne the first person I signed to Atlantic was Uzi. Oh, that so that was under Atlantic as well. Okay. Yeah, so like I was signed to Atlantic as an artist originally. Mm -hmm. Like I did my artist deal through Atlantic Grand Hustle, and then I left, and I went over to E1. And then, you know, when I went to E1, I started honestly putting out better records, and I had more success with my own records. And then, you know, shout out to my man Sam Crespo, who worked at Atlantic, who was, you know, working a lot of my records. He presented the opportunity for me to come back as an a and um, And, you know, when I took the job, I also, you know, brought to them Mean Street Studios and they became my partner in the studio. But they were like kind of putting me with uh different artists to as an A and R. Mm -hmm. And it just I was I was trying to find my footing. And when um when Cannon brought Uzi to the table and then I brought Uzi to Atlantic, you know, that was literally our first signing you know, to the company. And we did it in a sense where like we signed him to generation now and we did our production deal with Atlantic instead of me just kind of like an A&R and signing him to the building because, you know, they, they early on, it wasn't that they believed in little Uzi. They believed in 
the v- DJ drama. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And what I was bringing to the table. Um, so, so yeah, that's pretty much how that went. When you're analyzing a new artist, how does this play out in your head? Because a lot of times when you're signing an artist, you have to like see 2% of the superstar in them. You have to be able to look past whatever weird clothes they might be wearing because they're brand new in their career and they're, you know, maybe they're broke, they ain't got no jewelry, they don't got cool hair, et cetera. But as a person who has to sign an artist, like a lot of people out there think that they would be great A&Rs right. because they could tell you that the artists who are already signed mm-hmm. and already are starting to That's look the, like they might right. be successful mm-hmm. are going to be successful. Yeah. That's way different than like what you do with, with somebody like Uzi at that time. I mean, it's the equivalent of like looking at like a high school basketball mm-hmm. player and being able to say, oh, he's going to make it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's tough, you know? I mean, Jack the same way, like – if you were to see Jack in 2018, I, I think you know, I interviewed him in 2018. Yeah, you know, and it didn't seem like a sure thing yet. You feel what I'm saying? So you know, it's um, like it, it, it's really more of like when I when I talk to them and when we when we have those initial conversations and early on and hear the drive and the ambition and the conviction that they have to like want to be great that's for me it's what's like okay like I'm in you know what mm-hmm. I mean like I'm 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 along for this ride you know whether you know win or lose you know what I'm saying I I see that you want to be one of the, those ones and I know what that feeling is like so I'm willing to take this 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 chance and this opportunity and put my eggs in this basket and, and let's rock. What about like the self-destructive behaviors that a lot of young rappers are going to have? Cause I've definitely been in the position where I wanted to sign somebody before. And then I really just kind of thought about what a fucking headache dealing with them and their bad habits might be. Yeah. And that made me very, very hesitant. It's tough. I mean, you know, it's like, it, it's like having a family member or being a parent, you know what I'm saying? And having to, to deal with, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to make this sound like I'm, I'm saying someone's a child, but you know, as a, a young adolescent or a, a young adult, like you're going through a lot of things and you got to think like when someone comes into your life or you, or you meet an artist, like, let's say you meet them at 18, 19, 20, like you didn't know them for those other 18 formative years of their lives or what they've been through or, or have to go through or, you know, where their mental health is. And, you know, those are, those are real life issues with everyone. So it's like you meet them at a, 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 a certain point in their life. And then as time goes on, and especially when like success comes, you know, that, success doesn't always bring out all positive things in one person. Like it can bring out, like you said, some like self-destructive behavior and um, you got to be prepared. Like if you're ready to be along that rod and that journey, like it's definitely not, it's not easy. The music business is not easy when it comes to that, you know, Mm. for sure. Not at all. Yeah. But I mean, do you look at someone, could you look at an artist who just has the vibe and the look and not the music? Or does the music always have to be already, like, at least showing the potential to be great? That's hard because, you know, my ear is probably trained a certain way. So, like, I have the confidence and the faith to not always trust my ear. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm a kid from the 90s. Like, I grew up on Tribe Called Quest and Doggy Style and fucking uh, De La Soul, you know what I'm saying? And and Snoop and, you know, Wu-Tang, you know what I mean? So when I first heard the Migos, when I first heard Bando, it didn't necessarily, like, spark my ear to be like, oh, my God, these niggas is about to be one of the greatest hip-hop groups of all time. Mm. But, you know, I also had enough faith and trust um, that I was like, look, like if the, if this is what the kids is fucking with, like, all right, let me see where this could go. You know what I'm saying? Um, same, you know, same with Vert in a sense. Like, you know, I definitely early on knew he was a spitter or like when, when Cannon and Uzi were working on Love is Rage, like, you know, it had a certain sound to it. And like, I didn't know that it was going to be, jump out the window the way it was potentially you know what i'm saying so like i think the music is definitely important but i think you know like what you said like 
I don't think what we know today as we may once have is like what quote unquote a star is supposed to look like really exists anymore. Like, mm. you know, a lot of artists today don't technically or necessarily look like stars, you know what I'm saying? Or they come in various shapes and sizes. So you can't even look at somebody all the time and be like, oh, they're a star. Now, personality goes a long way, um, but, you know, there's, there definitely needs to be potential in music. Like, I don't know if I could just sign something that I think is trash. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But I could sign something that people are fucking with and think is dope, and I might not necessarily get into my car and ride to it, per se. There was times back 2017-ish when I would see a young artist, and maybe I'd look at him think, like, he kind of has the look. He kind of has a little bit of star power or something. And I would check out the music. I'd be like, this music fucking sucks. <laughs> I give up. It's not happening. <laughs> And then somebody I know will go get the the little like you know ability to bring them to the labels, bring them to the labels, get hundreds of thousands of dollars, a million dollars, whatever. And then this person has basically like moved on from dealing with them within like a couple months. And I was just you know that was kind of amazing to me. I'm like, oh, so I was right that this artist didn't have long term potential. But I, what uh. I was wrong about was that he did have short term potential, at least in the sense that. If I had really understood the label game, I would have bamboozled, been gotcha. able to bamboozle the the label into getting that big advance or whatever. You Interesting. Know? It's kind of like two different things, right? I don't think I'm good in the sh in the short term game. I think I'm me and my guys are are better in the long term game for mm. sure. You know, and you know the short term game is lucrative too. So nothing against that by no means. You know what I mean? And I think that in that in that way, like it can still pan out and be uh financially successful for all parties involved but that 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 definitely hasn't been my strong point for the most part like mm -hmm. obviously you know like most of the artists that I've worked with or that I'm attached to have been here for the long haul so you sign an artist and then how involved do you want to be because I feel like if I were to sign an artist that would be the other weird thing for yeah. me is Part of me would want to go to every interview, would yeah. want to go to every studio session. Right. And then in reality, I know this is true for you too, is you don't you do not have that time. No. At all. Um, but you know, I'm as involved as as necessary, especially in the beginning. Like, you know, obviously when we sign a new artist, you know, I'm be I'm gonna be able to walk them into rooms that they might not necessarily be able to get into or sit down with uh, uh, Adam twenty two or, you know, I'm able to take them on tour like this summer I'm going out with Snoop and Wiz. So whatever new artists we have, you know, on the roster will come out on a row with me and I'll put them on stage in front of 15,000 early on in their career before it's time or, um, you know, introduce them to, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z and be able to say, yo, this is my new guy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and that matters because at this point, if I introduce my new artist to a, a caliber artist, uh, artists right now they're gonna be like oh, okay I need to definitely tune in and and make sure I keep my eye open because of drums track record you know what mm -hmm. I mean so um as time goes on obviously when artists become more successful the involvement like uh decreases but I'm I'm fine with that you know what I'm saying because they figure out their own rhythm you know they 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 um they start to you know gain uh their their own traction and and what have you and then you know the the dichotomy changes where it's like dj drama's here they're here mm. and then you know the what you want to happen and what i i'd love to see happen is then they go here and it's like said artist is here and dj drama's here and then that's time for me to go you know work on building the next artist up mm, definitely um hold on one second my brain froze there for good. a second. <laughs> but you, and then just to your point too, like I'm, I'm as involved or uninvolved as they would like me to be. Like, you know, I do think part of the blessing with us is like, even me being the figure that I, I, I am in hip hop and being DJ drama, like it's still, I'm still capable of playing the background. Like, you know, I don't necessarily like have to you know they don't necessarily have to feel like they're battling with me for 
um, attention. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? In a, in a way. So because you've had so much attention that I feel like as you get older, it's a little bit less appealing to constantly yeah. be shoving yourself. And as you get older, it can sometimes be a bad look. We always remember, like, come to death row if you don't want motherfuckers dancing in your videos, 100%. right? 100%. Yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't, we don't want to be those guys or that guy. Like, you know, I don't, I don't mind playing the back and, you know, watching said artist or, you know, any artist that um, we have with us, like, prosper and, like, get all the accolades for that. Like, I just, I just love seeing the success story of, you know, budding talent turn into, like, superstar. Mm, Definitely. You ever been in the situation where you're backstage at a show and, you're considering like just kind of walking out on the stage because either your artist is out there or whatever, and you get two options. Mm-hmm. You could either like kind of just walk over to the DJ booth, like assuming you're not DJing, and and say whatever you stand there, act like your being on stage is no big deal, or you could be like, nah, give me a mic and go out there and start jumping up and down and turn the fucking crowd up. Mm-hmm. And I've I've done both, and it's kind of fucking weird because it's like by going out there and and putting all your energy into it there's part of it where it's like oh i'm expecting y'all to care <laughs> and i almost don't want to be that person yeah. i want to just be like humble enough that i could just act like oh y'all care about me okay that's right cool, right I guess. right what, what's your I've default be, i've been in that situation um where i've been like at a show and like on the side of the stage and the crowd will notice me and and get excited um i'm not just coming out on stage and with a mic like unless asked upon, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, but like, you know, and like last year, like there were there were some shows that Jack had that were, you know, he needed me to fill in as his DJ. And I was, you know, like, no doubt. Like, you know, that's what I do for a living. So I didn't mind doing it um, when when called upon. And um, yeah, like I'm a, I'm a play to, I'm a play the role, you know, in that, in that situation, like, that's what he needs me for. So of course, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a go above and beyond to add to the show and to the element. But yeah, like, but then at the same time, like if, if it's not the situation, like I'm DJ drama, the executive, and I'm gonna just try to slide to the side and slide to the booth and stand there. And, you know, if the people see me, like they see me, but it's not like, I'm not, I don't need to be like, Hey, look at me. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it's, it's drama. Like, right. Especially when you're with, uh, Jack Harlow or right. Uzi where it's like this is your fucking fan base. 100%. I don't want to be right. intruding on this relationship Absolutely. that y'all have built. Now I understand that some of y'all are going to like me but I don't want to <laughs> assume that y'all are going to love me. For sure. Interesting. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. And it's dope because like it's been just that. Like you know and it's weird. Like there are people that have just gotten familiar with me because of Uzi or Jack. Like mm-hmm. you know like and that's crazy to think but they're like oh DJ Drama yes the guy that's on Jack Harlow. Like um, going even going on tour last year, I went on tour with Wiz and Logic, and you know the fan base have just at the at the shows we're getting younger and younger. But uh, just like what they know me for, it's 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 so interesting what people know me for. Like right. some people will know me for the Tyler Project, some people will know me for Vert and and, and Harlow, some people will know me for Gangsta Grill, some people will know me for my wishing record with Chris Brown. Like, it's just... And it goes through phases. Yeah. Because you could sign an artist tomorrow, and if they become the number one rapper, then to a huge percentage of the people, you are the guy who is with that guy. Right. You're not... So. Like, you. Like I remember when I was Lil Pump's friend. <laughs> like, a whole year where I was Lil Pump's friend. Like, everybody who, who saw... I had people yelling from my, their car, hey, it's Lil Pump's friend. I wasn't really, like, <laughs> yeah, like that known as an interviewer yet, so it kind of made more sense. <laughs> But it was just a wild feeling to be like, oh, shit, I'm I'm in this current arc of my life where this one thing means so much more than anything else that I ever did. It's, it's kind of crazy, right? But you got to just embrace it. Like, you know, you got to, hey, if, if that's what you want to love me for, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, just roll with it. Like, yeah, yeah I mean, there, there's a negative connotation to the idea of like riding waves. Right. Well, let's be real. If you're in music, oh. if you're in media, you're riding waves. Listen. I've, you know, I, I've, I said on a future tape quite some time ago, like, you know, and this is true, like, if I wasn't a DJ, I would want to be a surfer. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I've always had dreams. My white side, if, you know, was more dominant, maybe I would have wound up in California being a surfer for a living, but it, I worked out to become a DJ. But, you know, in, in me saying that line, it was like, you know, I, you know, I navigate, I, I ride waves better 
than y'all like you know i was i was just making some some connotation to you know surfing and waves but yeah like respectfully and i don't want it, to it's not a negative thing but like i've been riding waves for a long time in my career you know and by saying that that's like me saying like i've gone from you know watching the roots come up to you know dj and for ti to this you know legendary list of of mixtapes that i've done with so many artists to being a part of like these careers and everything and those are like you know those are all waves so i'm not saying it's it's not in a in a in a negative way where i'm taking advantage of the wave but i'm definitely you know on the surfboard you know riding the wave to get where i'm at when i saw you uh say that about how you saw the roots his career unfold from early on i was kind of amazed just because to me They've just been around for fucking forever. Like Real I remember shit. getting their CDs out of the the back of the magazine where it would have like you know ten CDs for oh fifty my, cents or whatever yeah. the fuck it was. Wow! And they'd send it to your house, and like I probably wouldn't have like purchased a root cd uh -huh. at that time in my life except for the fact that there was only so many <laughs> hip-hop releases uh -huh. so all the conscious hip-hop and shit that i know about from that period of my life is yeah. pretty much because of those fucking mail order things <laughs> but a bit of shits and and even then i was i was watching the oscars uh the other day and just yeah. seeing quest love and, up? yeah and they're treating him like a god like he I just had, carries such a status in crazy, this world bro now. i used to i used to play video games with him when i was in high school like right. run into him on south street like you know, like the roots for me are the epitome of like the the first time me seeing somebody make it in the rap game and, and being a, a real believer like, oh, this shit can really happen. Like it could really come true, you know, and that's a that's an ode to like how long I've been doing this shit or, you know, where my career started from and where it's at. Like literally it's because of the fucking roots. And like you said, like the roots have been here since the early 90s and i was in high school watching them come up um and you know got befriended by black thought by uh rest in peace malik b dice raw you know and quest and like so so how many official members were there i thought i thought it was like nine at, at one point or was it less that were officially signed um early on so early on i mean it was it was quest it was it was black thought it was malik b um it was it was hubbard um and Kamal came, I think, by the second album, if I'm not mistaken. So, but I, I go back even earlier, like, you know, they, they had this, um, uh, what was the name of the crew? Um, Foreign Objects. Mm -hmm. So they had, like, other members, like uh, my man uh, Kenyatta, like my man Dame um, from, from Philly, like, that all were kind of, like, part of the Foreign Objects crew and click and, and what have you. But, but yeah, but again like still for me too like to watch quest's like rise and to watch him at the oscars and to think like man like you know that's that's the, the guy I used to run on run into on south street and he would let me hear like black thought demos rapping like cool g rap like it's, it's pretty cool how far we've come that's a weird feeling when like most of the people that you knew 30 years ago are distant memories where it's like you're just never i mean a large percentage of them are no longer with us yeah. they're just not that you have nothing in common with them you would mm -hmm. never run into them and then to even see people who started out with you yeah. or who were who they saw you as a real young guy who wasn't even successful yet right. it's crazy and to then be like damn we're both like actually still doing the thing that we wanted to do yeah that's pretty that's dope you it's know a who weird else, connection you know who else i have that connection with is stevie williams Really? Shout yeah. out to Stevie Williams. Yeah. Great guy. Um, so, you know, before I was really into DJing, I was into skateboarding. Right, the Philly connection. Yeah. Okay. So, you, you, you were at Love Park? Yeah, I was at Love mm. Park. I was at Love Park every day. Really? Every day. That's sick. Like, my my dad used to work up the street um, at this spot called American Friends Service Committee. So I would literally, after school, go downtown or on the weekends, go to Love Park. And around that time... There was like this this small crew of of black skateboarders, mm -hmm. and Stevie was the youngest out of all of us, and but he was the nicest. So like, you know, I we met. I was what probably thirteen, fourteen. He was ten, eleven, or something like that. And you know, we we've known each other that long. And it's like I went away to college. <clears throat> he moved to California, and I start. You know, I remember when he first like really started blowing up and i was like damn like stevie really did it mm. and then for us to connect years later you know and to to like be like man we really did it it's like fucking crazy i seen him maybe a year ago in the mall with his kid mm -hmm. 
and I wasn't with my kid. It might have been longer if, if I wasn't with my kid, but it was definitely a moment where I seen him, I started talking to him, and I just felt the energy in him was a little different because he was splitting his time at that moment between having a conversation with me and being a dad. Yeah. And when you're seeing somebody in dad mode, yeah. it's such a different version sometimes. <laughs> People will see me sometimes out in public and they'll hear me saying like, you have to go to the bathroom, okay? Like, you know, like, and they're looking at me like, what the fuck? That's hilarious. <laughs> That's, that shit, I'm sure people do that shit to me too. Like, seeing me out with my daughters and looking at DJ drama in dad mode. Like, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. But okay, so... This is one thing I find interesting about you versus me is that okay. I, I like kind of got into this place in large part because I was going out. I was in clubs. I was in warehouse shows. I was going to rap cl shows. Like I was really, if I wanted to get an interview, I was like going to your shows until I got some FaceTime and I figured I'm going to turn that into the interview. And as time went by, it kind of became more like, all right. I got a team who's putting together the interviews for me uh -huh. and I got, you know, a family life where I'm trying to like, you know, I'm not going out at night or anything like that. But when I see you, it still feels like you kind of have this like, it's almost like a politician where, you know, those motherfuckers are just running around into their eighties. <laughs> like, you know, I don't like Donald Trump, but it's like where, like this energy level that he has seems pretty unbelievable. So is it, do you choose to like continue to push yourself and move around like that? Cause it kind of sounds like you're doing a lot of this label work and, and yeah. business stuff while also being on tour and, yeah. and doing a couple hours of DJing every night or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, I'm out and about a lot. It's it's wild because, you know, I really I'm really like a homebody at heart. Like if I'm not working, I really love to be in a crib. Like I'm a movie buff. I will stay in the crib if I'm not working on the weekends. I don't want to go nowhere. Like I'm putting on on demand or Netflix. But you know, thankfully, the type of career I have or you know the type of job I have it calls on me to be out and about a lot so you know I am able to be in a lot of places and you know just even DJing like I don't have to DJ clubs anymore you know what I'm saying like you know um but I still I still do it because I like to stay in the mix mm -hmm. I like to stay fresh and current you know what I mean like there was a point in my life like when I was like maybe like 36 37, 38, where I, I told uh, my business partner, Lake, like, yo, when I turn 40, bro, like, I don't want to be in the clubs no more. Like, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the old nigga in the club. And then, you know, I turned 40 and, like, around 41. And then, like, I wasn't I wasn't working as much, you know, um, because I didn't want to. And then I guess I just got back into this mode where I was, like, you know, definitely I remember during COVID, too, you know, I used to, I, I never would be outside in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta, but I would never go out. I would just, you know, I would go out when I go to work. So during the pandemic, Atlanta was wide open and I found myself like being outside, going to clubs. And it was like, one of the reasons was because I just didn't want to get stagnant. I didn't want to get stale. Like I wanted to know what was still like going on like musically and like what was hot in the clubs and things like that because you're then, only going to be able to figure out so much from the you, internet yeah, versus you, really being yeah, there you, right you can't like you can't you can't be in the club especially like you know i'm not doing clubs for people my age like i'm doing clubs for a younger audience so you know you got to know what's what's really going on out there and you can't do that without really being in tune you know so um so yeah i, I play that role at times but there's definitely a part of me that is a homebody and loves to be in the crib, you know? And like, if I don't have to be there, like if I'm not getting paid to be there, uh, I might not necessarily be there, but I'm blessed to, you know, have to be a part of the Grammys or, you know, I'm putting an album out. So, you know, have listening parties and, you know, interacting with artists and things of that nature. So, it's a, it's a about it's a balance it's a balance mm. do you, you require old man time at this point in your life because that's how i kind of feel is like i can work my ass off all day but like at some point it's going to catch up a little bit to the point where i need to like actually get a really good night's sleep i need oh, to yeah. actually get some quality couch time oh yeah yeah i definitely make sure to get sleep for sure mm. like you know i mean i've i've created a regiment for myself where you know i wake up i go to the gym I'd get I I take my shots and my smoothie and you know I'd try to drink my gallon of water and you know if I'm in Atlanta for the most part I'm at the studio and then I'm going home and I'm going to bed like I'm not out in a strip club mm -hmm. and every night like that's not what I do. When so, did that stop being appealing? You know, it never really 
I never, I never really was that guy to be honest. Like, and, and that, that was some of the misconception, like even early on in my career, like even when I was coming up, like if I wasn't working, I was like in the crib, putting together mixtapes, like literally putting together mixtapes to go hustle, to move them around. So like when I kind of like got on and became DJ drama, and I had records. There were like DJs that at one point felt like, yo, Drum don't come out and show us love. He don't fuck with us. Mm -hmm. Like, he don't be out. And I was like, nigga, I never really was out. Like, it's not like I got on and stopped going out. I just, I never was out like that, you mm -hmm. know? But, um, you know, it's it's a sensitive world. So people want to feel the love and 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 for you to show love. And I, and I respect that and I get it. But um, yeah, I, it never, like, yeah, I'm the strip clubs have been around for being outside is like that shit is not going nowhere and it's been here forever. So, you know, it's very rare that I get FOMO for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Yeah, but there, there's an extent to which and maybe like some people still probably enjoy that, like being in a strip club every night. Like, right. No, 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 no. I know. It, and I'm going to be real with you. Like, I remember time periods in my 20s where I thought that every stripper was hot as fuck. Any strip club I went to seemed so cool. And then I just get to a point in my life where it's like, I've met 50,000 girls like the ones who are on stage. <laughs> I know ways that I could get in communication to y'all with y'all if I really wanted to spend time with you or whatever. It's not like I need to come here and throw money to try to make a good impression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just I understand the business model too much. It's yeah. like there's nothing cool to me about spending thousands of dollars on bottles. I don't really get it. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I just at some point you just start to know too much and it makes a it hard thousand, to enjoy that shit. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. I can't agree more. Yeah. But uh, but then at the same time, like that is kind of where a lot of the the records pop off, yeah, where a I lot mean, of the energy comes from. Right? Yeah, it definitely is. You know, it's 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 part of the job. I can't front like you know. There's it's definitely where some of the energy comes from from the music and the records. And um, again, part of it is you know shaking hands and uh, kissing babies. Yeah, relationships in general. Right? Yeah, for sure. Is that something that you've always kind of had? ingrained in you is that you just understood the value of the relationships that you're building for in the music industry and outside of it for some somewhat i mean i just think it's good to be a a, a good human being or a stand-up person you know so you know those are just like morals just in in any part of life but you know relationships are definitely key um and for me you know even at a time when like I might not be in the mix all the time, like I like to think that I have the type of relationships with with people that like if needed, if needed, like I'm to call like if you need me, to pick up the phone and like yo drum, I need you for so and so. I'm there for you, you know, mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know what I mean? So. Um, I feel like I have long standing relationships with with a lot of individuals, you know, uh, that whether it's artists or, you know, pro managers, producers, what have you that, you know, we've been in this business so long and have run run across each other and, and done so many things together. So, like, you know, I, I definitely take pride in just, you know, being a stand up individual and stand up person. I bet the wherever you're at now though is a lot less complicated than back in the day having to try to figure out these mixtapes and having to deal with like people who had beef on them not to mention like people wanting their songs appearing in certain orders and stuff i was yeah. listening to a podcast the other day uh where they were talking about fuck who was it it was a oh it was nori nori <laughs> Got really, really mad at DJ Clue at one point because he told them, don't put me on your tapes unless I'm in the top five <laughs> on the tape. Did anyone ever try to say anything like that to you? Well, first five by songs. The time, I mean. By the time my mixtapes really became a thing, it was past that era. So the era that I was, that I came up in was more like, the projects that I were doing were gangster grills where they were all based around oh, yeah. individual artists. So, you know, during that era where like the, the top slots mattered, I wasn't hot yet. So nobody really gave a fuck about where they were on my tape. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I got to skip that one. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I saw them. Or, all right. So I saw a clip when I was searching your name on YouTube last night, I saw a clip of academics on Vlad and I don't know if you talked to him about this today, but you said 
or he said that he thought that the rift or the sort of stalemate between you guys and Uzi might have occurred once mm. Uzi saw the royalty yeah. statements for EXO Tour Life. Yeah, he brought that up. Okay. <laughs> well, here, let's double down. What, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, is there any truth to that? No. Really? No, because it was already it was already happening. I, I reminded him that like Uzi started taking shots on social media at me when people started um addressing or attacking him about putting out music. Mm. And so he started to point the finger in my direction saying drum or they're holding up the music. You know what I mean? So um the the Exo Tour Life shit was just total nonsense. Like mm -hmm. the numbers like it said we, the song made 50 million or f bro we didn't even make five million off the record like really yeah and and people have to put in put in comparison like no not comparison but put in the understanding okay generation now as a label is owned by myself lake show leighton morrison and don cannon and we split our percentage three ways mm -hmm. and every deal that we've ever structured the artist has always gotten a larger percentage than we get so let's just clarify that so whatever amount that they're getting is always been more than what we're getting and then whatever amount we're getting we're splitting three ways mm -hmm. so yeah it was never a financial it was never a financial issue it wasn't what what was the major hold up at it that never time? there never was i mean it never was spoken upon it was always that said that we don't want him to drop or they don't want me to drop music but it's like Bro, why would we not want you to drop music? Like right. we what we don't gain from that. <laughs> from most artists, taking a big long hiatus like that is kind of a death sentence. He's like the rare artist who's hot enough that it yeah. didn't matter, right? It's pretty dope to watch, you know. I mean, you know, he's he's had those moments where, you know, it's been like people have been fiending for Uzi music and then um you know, he takes his time with the music and now he's in another great spot with I just wanna rock mm -hmm. and then He's definitely, you know, like people have been waiting on the pink tape and um, it's it's pretty much complete. Like it's really about to come out like mm -hmm. real shit. And how involved in that are you? Um, me, myself, not so involved, but like Cannon is, is very, very involved. Um, him and Cannon have been working like um, – religiously you know um on the project and in music and which you know was always a lot of what the relationship was like ken and uzi were pretty much like the ones in the studio um working on his sound and you know finding the pockets and you know on the creative aspect and um lake lake was very influential and hands-on when it came to vert's business and touring and things like that and i was just for the most part for uh vert situation just the one like waving the flag early on like mm. little uzi vert little uzi vert you know hey this is the new guy you know what i'm saying so and then once he became the guy you know my role kind of wasn't as necessary you know what i'm saying and so you right in there kind of contains like the problem that happens with a lot of artists <laughs> right which is that <laughs> They need you so bad when you sign them. And then as time goes by, they need you less. I sign OnlyFans girls. So this is my main understanding like of this. this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that could be kind of weird because you're trying to continue to participate. Right. And then they're like, what do I need you for? Right. Yeah. I'm, and if it was I'm a fucking hot. If it was a software company, it would just be understood. Like, I own 20% of this business. It is what it is. Like, I'm right. getting paid. Right. But with rappers, it, it, it's like, why am I giving you this money? What are you doing yeah. for me? Because <laughs> every song and every performance or whatever, everything feels like it's them doing it. Right. You know, it's like, that's my labor. Yeah. Um, I think that's always been part you know that's probably always the issue in the music business just in general like mm. through time like you know artists you know i mean they don't re realize or understand the value of equity you know what i'm saying like the reason why we're investing this amount of money time and so many things early on is for the you know the 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 gain later you know what i'm saying but once the gain come the gain comes later in artist's career you know i just think a lot of times they look and they're like hold on like i'm 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 the star i'm i'm hot like i did this you know what i'm saying 
And unfortunately, you know, they forget a lot of what, you know, how you allowed them to stand on their shoulders. And and by me saying this, I'm not even speaking directly on like my artists or like our situations. I'm just saying that's just how it seems it's been in the music business in general. Like uh, a wise man once told me that a wise man once said to him in the music business, like, yo, you only you really only get like three years with the artists. And mm. then it's like shit goes left. Right. So you consider that like almost a sure thing at a certain point? I mean, I've seen it time and time again. I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, it's it's very rare that, you know, artists, I feel like, stay with their original team or stay around the ones that they, you know, kind of started with. You know, mm. we see a lot of times when they start, you know, changing management or changing teams or just like, you know. It happens. So how do you insulate yourself or prepare for that when you're dealing with somebody like Jack Harlow, who I, I have no idea what you guys' relationship is like, but it's obvious that whatever he was making three years ago, he hmm. was making a, an extreme multiple of that now. Like, you have to kind of, like, anticipate shit yeah. getting a little rocky, right? Like, how do you prep for that? I mean, I don't anticipate getting rocky. I mean, you know, you, you would love to go to – every artist early on and be like yo like let's just remember where we are now like when you when you make it like don't don't go left you know what i'm saying so um you know jack's just a, a good guy like he's a he's a solid individual a good human being and you know his his rise and his success like um obviously it's changed him in the sense of like his discipline and his focus and like you know he's not somebody that go you know, you don't see jack at the parties or the strip club or things like that like the guy doesn't even drink like mm. he's very he's very tunnel vision for what he wants to accomplish um but yeah i mean there you know there uh, there could potentially be rocky times and you know but there's there's always like there's a love and a respect there so you know, um, I think I think in general, there's just, you know, it happens a lot behind the scenes that we don't even know about in certain instances. Obviously, we live in a world today where a lot of things get publicized. But, um, you know, I mean, just like with Vert, like, you know, it was it was a rocky road for a minute, but we got over the hump and, you know, we're in a great space now. Mm. I mean, you talked about your black side being dominant. Is it, is it <laughs> kind of interesting working with an artist who, I mean, clearly Jack Harlow's touch you know in touch with black culture yeah but he is very much a white guy absolutely um well what I, I i loved about him from day one was his uh his authenticity and the fact of him not trying to be something he wasn't and you know just being comfortable in his own skin you know what i mean like jack never kind of came off like you know he was um like I think that he 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 understands and respects the fact that he is a visitor to the culture, but he also attacks it and approaches it like, yo, like I want to be one of the greats. Like, yeah, I'm white, but beyond that, like I'm a hip hop artist, and like I'm going for the gusto, you know, point blank. Period. Whoever's on my left, whoever's on my right, whoever's in front, or whoever's in back of me, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And I feel like in 2023, like you know, we've seen, you know, I mean, shit. One of one of the 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 top rapper of all time, you know, is a half Jewish white kid. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I mean, he's he's also black. You know what I mean? As I am, but you know, there's no at this point in, in this stage in hip hop, like I don't think there's a, it, it's, it's so uh, genre bending in so many ways that, you know, anything could necessarily go. Yeah. Hip hop can be so many things now. Whereas when, you know, f f rewind to the, the height of gangster girls or, or, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, hip hop was a very specific thing for, for sure. the most part. I mean, yeah. we, and we were just talking about the roots. They were a real outlier. Absolutely. But like the kind of stuff you were doing on gangster girls was right. pretty, I don't want to say one dimensional, but it fit into no, a certain lane. It did. And now none of us are surprised when we see a little Nas X popping off or a Lizzo, which right. is not necessarily a rapper, but right, you know, right, like right. a Jack Harlow, et cetera. Like we all understand. I know tons of country rappers right. who pretty much just 
uh, you know, market themselves to like a country mm -hmm. audience and right. seem to be doing very well. And they're not really like mainstream, but they do. They're clearly living very, very well. I mean, yeah. there's there's a shitload of lanes that all are inside of hip hop. What was interesting is I even wanted to make. Like when I started Gangsta Grills, like like you said, it was definitely somewhat one dimensional and like it was a Southern trap brand. But, you know, because of even my roots in hip hop or like um, my lineage, like when I got the opportunity to branch out and to do like a Pharrell Gangsta Grills or do like a little brother Gangsta Grills or like. I mean, I've literally ran the gambit from from the guys I mentioned to Chris Brown to Jeremiah to Deb Prez to Rhapsody, to Childish Gambino, to even just recently, like, winning a fucking Grammy with Tyler, the creator, for mm -hmm. Gangsta Grills, or a, a Dreamville, like, you know, like, I, I wanted to take the brand in various directions just for that, for it to be somewhat multidimensional and to be able to, to encompass, like, all facets of the culture and not just be see seen as this one thing, because... That's how I that's how I live and breathe hip hop. Like, you know, I wanted to listen to fucking the chronic just as much as I wanted to listen to De La Soul. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And like I I think that, you know, it we it all can have its its lane and its direction and 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 all live and breathe under the same, you know, home. Definitely. Do you give a shit at all when you see people on Twitter complaining about you saying the N-word? Hmm, I think it's funny. Um, yeah, I don't, I definitely don't give a shit. Like, you know, I like to, like, I, my man Barry Hefner um, put a, a a tweet up the other day. Like, what is it, what is it in an artist's brain that makes them look past the thousand positive comments and mm -hmm. focus on, like, the two, three, four negative comments? Yeah. So, like, you know, I'll see people, like, complain about me saying nigga or me screaming on tapes or something like that. But I like to have fun with it. Like, you know, I, I'll, I'll troll them back, but, like, at this point, I'm like, my thing is like, bro, like, do y'all really think I would been able to get away with saying nigga this long? Like, and if I was not black, like that, that shit just kind of blows my mind. Like y'all, like y'all really think like after being in a game this long on these many mixtapes, DJ drama with this pale ass, light ass skin saying nigga, like you don't think someone would have checked me by now? Is like that part of you that's <laughs> like, listen, if someone was gonna check me, it was gonna be Gucci Mane, it was gonna be T it was gonna be like yeah, one of somebody, many somebody would have checked, yeah. Cl you know. Clearly T Clifford Harris would have been like, Hold on now, my guy. Like <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but you know, I mean Hey, people don't know my name is Tyrese and K. Simmons. So, right. you know, thankfully my parents gave me a black ass name. Um, but, uh, Fair. yeah, it comes with the territory, you know. I mean, it, it, but it, it doesn't bother me by all. I think it's funny. Yeah, I mean, I was interviewing this girl, Rella, from uh, Harlem. I think she's from, or she's from the Bronx or something like that. She's a, like, drill rapper from New York. Yeah. And I think she's a quarter black. Like, a her quarter. dad is half black. Okay. And I she did. says it like it's nothing. <laughs> and I seen, like, a clip from our interview going super. Super viral of someone just saying, "You are not black. You are not allowed to say it." And I mean, she doesn't look black, but I mean, if she's a quarter black, I mean, I'm certainly not the one to be making these rulings or anything. Right, but right. it's, it's kind of interesting. It seems like the the rules have maybe shifted a little bit. Where if if you're not represent, if you don't look black, it's then they up. maybe don't want to give it. Yeah, to Yeah, because they give Logic a, a hard time about it too. Mm -hmm. Like you know, but I mean. He's a black man, you know. I mean, I went on tour with the with the guy, and he, when he found out I was um, uh, black and white, he was he was ecstatic. Really? Yeah. He I, he he didn't know, but um, yeah. I don't I don't know where the you know I, I see them like give Fat Joe a hard time or yeah. like give Khaled a hard time. Like you gotta you gotta stop it. Like you gotta stop it. Like you know if obviously you know if it's a a white person you know it's a it's a no-go but a person of color like i don't know i mean that's just how i grew up you mm. know so uh you know but i'm i'm not the i'm not the judge and the jury of who can say the n-word and who can't you know what i mean it is kind of fascinating the way that <laughs> the culture just this I, I feel like people are gonna be talking about this till the end of time yeah oh uh, for sure i gotta check that girl out you're talking about i'm curious like because then she's because her father is half black, so, but then her mother is what, white? 
Uh, Puerto Rican, I think. Or, oh, her mom's Puerto Rican. Her dad's so. half black. Oh, yeah. I mean, and she's from New York. Like, yeah. she probably grew up saying nigga her whole life. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. When I'm like seeing like the, you know, she's from the projects. She's like fucking, she grew up in an environment where she, she probably didn't, almost never had anybody tell her not to say it until she got relatively well known. Right. You know? She looks white. She looks like a Puerto Rican chick to be real. She, okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But, um, okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the media's role in curating music at this point? Because I heard you talking kind of fondly about the not right days and the blogs and mm -hmm. everything and mm -hmm. how, you know, and even before that, like the, the magazines and everything, there were mm -hmm. all these forces in hip hop that were kind of doing the best that they could to tell you what was important. And I mean, when you look at a lot of like, if you pick up an old double XL magazine, it will astound you how transparent the relationship is between the advertisers and the content. Like, oh, the exact people that you guys are co are covering are also the people who have multiple full page ads. I'm sure that's a big coincidence. As a kid, I, I, there yeah, weren't no, enough I, rappers for me to notice that yeah. this was just how this worked, you know. And I feel like uh, things have changed a lot. Where you know you got playlists now. Yeah, it feels like that shit's all yeah. bought and paid for. Yeah. I don't know exactly how it works, yeah. but like, how, how do you feel about that? It feels like maybe there's no tastemakers, or at least not that many. Yeah, I mean, I said a long time ago, like you know, there's uh, there's not enough gatekeepers in hip hop. Like, who's letting these whack niggas in the door? Somebody got to stop giving out the the combination. Mm. Um, but like playlists have literally become what mixtapes were, and you know, like people work hard to get on them and you know there's obviously politics behind it you know i mean i would feel like that's somewhat like payola right if you like pay to get on a, a playlist like, yeah i mean i like, don't know exactly how it works but i know the artists signed to labels and then all of a sudden it seems like they become incredibly popular on and playlists. they get on playlists yeah. yeah but i mean i i just think at the end of the day i i think i think playlists are becoming somewhat uh overrated in a sense of importance like i don't think that playlists have the the power that we once may have thought they had you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying like you know just necessarily getting on a playlist doesn't equate to your record being out of here like the people still have to you know want to listen to that record or hear that song so um you know i i don't i don't live in live and die by that like you know what i'm saying like that's not the the most important or key element but you know it's, you also got to play the game like you love to turn a playlist on and see your music or see you know music from your artist or your label that's on the playlist um but outside of that you know i just believe in discovery just in it in its own in itself yeah it's weird though because like discovery with music a lot of times now is just scrolling through tiktok yeah that's that's wild to think too like that's that's really fucking wild. You're on TikTok? I'm not. I mean, not and and I probably should be. I mean, I have people working for me that's that are on TikTok, but like I'm definitely not on TikTok scrolling through looking for music. And it's occurred to me though, if like I wanted to find the next rapper, that probably it would make sense to just scroll Twitter or uh, excuse me, uh, TikTok a couple hours a day. Like yeah. like if because a lot of labels when I talk to artists, the labels just tell them like. <sighs> We need you to be going hard as fuck on TikTok. We need it's you crazy. making multiple TikToks a day. Yeah. That's the only way. Yeah, they do that shit. My label does that shit to me too. And I'm like, I'll just, i turn it over. I'll give them some content and put it up and let them turn it over. But like TikTok is very powerful. I mean, shit, right now I have a song from what, 11 years ago, uh, Future um, uh, Big Boy uh, called Ain't No Way Around It mm, was the classic. remix that's going insane really? on TikTok. What is it, sped up? No, there's like a dance that goes along with it. Mm. There's like a dance and and like a, a saying that goes along with it. So it was like it was in like the top five um, TikTok in the U.S. just recently, and that blows it up on streaming services and everything oh, as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah, that shit went went through the roof. So and that makes up for the fact that you make like fifty cents for a billion <laughs> views on right. TikTok. Yeah, so shout out to TikTok for that. You know, That's somebody true. told me the numbers between what TikTok paid the music industry and what YouTube paid the industry, mm -hmm. the music industry. And I, I don't want to disclose it, but I'm like, I want to tell you off air, but like, it's insane. It's like 
YouTube's like a hundred thousand times more, maybe it's insane. Yeah, it's like insane. Like it was unbelievable when they told me that shit. I couldn't even believe it. And so I was listening to an interview with one of the ladies who works for the venture capital firm or like whatever the bank the firm is that bought De La Soul's catalog. Yeah. And she's, it was really interesting because even though she was this super stiff corporate person, she's talking about like how this is a good investment for them and how they plan on being able to market it and, you know, make money from placements in movies and stuff, which mm -hmm. really matters because you think Absolutely. about some of those songs, you you hear uh, them in, in movies and they sound perfect, but right. they haven't really been able to be utilized in yep. movies because of all the samples and everything. Right, right. And so I'm listening to her talk about it and they're they're asking her like, how do you feel about TikTok? And she's like, their pitch is that it's a discovery app. So that's why you make jack shit on it is because this is about discovering music. Now, this clearly was not a very convincing argument to her either because, you know, yeah, people are discovering shit on there, but it's not like it converts one to one from, right. from TikTok to streaming services yeah. at all. Like, I don't know. I, I, I TikTok's almost, getting the fuck over. Yeah. <laughs> Insanely. Yeah. They are getting over. Boy, oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever thought about selling your catalog? Um, or part of it? Yes. A lot of people in your position are doing so right now and yeah. walking away with gigantic bags. Yeah. Um, we've had some conversations. Um, we definitely have, have had had some initial conversations and are in some conversations. So, um, you know, it's something on the table. It's kind of interesting, though, because... I mean, I'm sure you got enough money, but I could use some more. I mean, they said Metro got 70 million. Yeah, that's nice. Very few people I know the Metro Bullman. don't need 70 million. Yeah. Everybody kind of needs 70 million at some point, right? <laughs> Everybody needs 70 million. <laughs> I need 70 million. And I mean, people make a good point. It's like, I mean, you could keep making a million dollars a year for the next, you know, 40 mm. years that you're alive. Or you could take this bag now. Exactly. And, you know, we all have this idea in our head that we're going to, like, make all this stuff in our life and then we're going to give it to our kids. Right. In reality, your kids <laughs> probably know what's what to do with, like, some money better they, than they would know what to do with your cattle. Real or shit. Or your, you know, YouTube channel. They probably don't, sometimes don't even know what to do with the money. Yeah. <laughs> I asked my girl that the other day. Well, if I died right now and let's say that you own No Jumper, who are you selling it to? And she just freezes. She's like, I have to sell it? And I'm like, well, I mean, unless you want to spend your life running it, probably. And like, I'm like, actually, you know, you should just talk my account. And my account can probably create a little bidding war type thing that you could help manage and everything. But, I mean, it, it is kind of crazy to think about, like, what happens to the catalog after you die. I mean, listen, you know, I'm at that, I'm at a point in my life where, you know, I've probably lived at least uh, two-thirds. Hopefully, you know, I have another half of my life to live out but mm -hmm. you know you you gotta you do think about those things like and if i if i'm in a position where you know i can get a hundred million tomorrow or 150 million tomorrow for our catalog like i would i would much rather do that and be able to you know utilize that money and do something with it instead of like continue to hold out and you know not and what get a couple million every year in a sense you know what i'm saying like you know what you could do with 70 million you know mm -hmm. what i mean you know what you could do with 30 million you know like i can if and if you can't like t i can clearly turn 30 million into 100 million or See, 100 I really, million into I, 250 that's like, the problem though i haven't thought that far ahead i do not know what the fuck i'm doing with 70 million yeah besides sitting in the bank and probably paying taxes on it well yeah i mean so then you got to pay the portion of your taxes on it but you know i mean you're a smart guy. I'm sure you have, you know, somewhat of a portfolio. So, you know, there you've made enough money. I'm sure there's investments and in, in things uh, that are part of your portfolio outside of No Jumper that's making you money. Definitely, so, yeah. so that's my thing with it. Like, yeah, if if I can cash out and then you know move that money into other places to do, you fucking right. But are like, you investing in a lot of like non rap things? Cause it, like it, in a sense, I noticed that with some, QC, some things with QC, they just sold their cattle or they, uh, you know, sold the company and everything. But I noticed that they bought like 30 Bojangles, like right yeah. before that. And mm -hmm. I was, that was kind of a moment where I was like, Oh, so y'all are planning on being rich forever and not needing to depend on finding the next hot artist. You That's got interesting. to, yeah. you got to, I mean, you know, me and my partner have a, um, um a company where we you know we own apartment buildings 
um, you know, I'm an investor in in Liquid Death. Oh, really? Um, yeah, wow. I'm, I'm 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 an investor in some 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 other things as well. You know, you have a fifty cent vitamin water uh, return from that yet? <laughs> I haven't. We haven't gotten a return yet. Okay, um, but you know, shout the Liquid Death for sure. Um, my man Cannon has a Tomorrow app, which is doing incredibly well. That you know, so yeah. I mean, I, I just think at this stage in the game, like. You know, definitely you got to put your eggs in various baskets. Like all my money is is not coming in strictly from music, you know. So I've I've made some some good investments and, and put my money in some places that have enabled me to make money while I sleep. Right. Yeah. I was astonished when I realized how much money you were. Well, you didn't say the number, but how much you were making from Dat Piff and shit back in the day. Oh, yeah. It was insane. I mean, literally, like I was making more money in the Dat Piff era than I made like before when I was like hustling mixtapes on my own. See, I would not have known. Shit was crazy. I would bro. not have known that the ad space that they were selling would have put them in the position to give uh, you that much and, money. And what was so crazy to me was what and and the. I used to almost kind of get mad at myself because I was like, damn, like if that piff is able to give me 50, 60, 70 grand a month for doing these tapes and making them exclusive to them, like imagine what they're making. Mm. And it's like, damn, why didn't I think of, why didn't I think to build this app? Like my name was strong enough and big enough in the mixtape game that I could have potentially like did it myself and did like, drama like the dj.com and that would be the go-to site for all things mixtapes but you know in hindsight like you know i did very well salute shout to my man kp like we had a great partnership and you would have got washed away once the streaming area came in yeah anyway, i right? mean that's 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 true too so you know but there was a big rumor that dad piff was officially offline I, the I other day that. but I then saw i saw it confirmed that it no it's still it's online not, yeah. although i don't think that they're putting out new stuff on there maybe I don't yeah know. it's 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 weird but it's like you know that that shit is a is a vital space because that's where a lot of art and music lives that doesn't live anywhere else you know mm -hmm. that's not available on the dsps you know and it's like if we were to lose that we lose so much of like a rich history and culture that's so important to hip-hop you know what i mean so mm -hmm. um that shit needs to get figured out you know i mean it, it's because 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 there could be a period where we lose you know that music and that and that time you know what i mean like until you know and it's probably damn near impossible but like i would love to bring the whole gangster girls catalog to the dsps mm -hmm. but it's like you know I, it's something I'm, I'm working on slowly but surely but just in general like you know there's so much music out there from that era that could potentially just go be forgotten about i know sometimes i will think of like an old dipset song like i and i can remember like a lyric or two and I'll be sitting there on Google trying to type in the lyric and, and just find it. And I can't fucking find it. And then it kind of occurs to me like, that was on some random mixtape. Real shit. That nobody remembers. Yep. And probably has some crazy sample in it. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it is out there, but right. like it's, it's going to be tough. tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough. So, um, and that's what's dope about like where I, the space I've been in recently. Like, and I think that has brought the excitement back. Like, you know, when people listen to the Jeezy Snowfall or hear me on Dreamville or Tyler or the multiple projects I've been doing, it's like it's that mixtape feel from that time. You know what I mean? And it's like for those who are around during that time, it's like they get the nostalgia of it. For those who it's new to, it's like, oh, this is dope. Like, you know, this is kind of like a new concept to them that they're getting familiar with. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think that's why I like you know, because of the success of Call Me If You Get Lost and the other projects I've been doing, like I've been on this run with, with Gangsta Grills where it the resurgence of it is because, you know, people miss that feel, like, you know what I mean? And it's like, that's what separated a mixtape from an album. And before I was in this space, people were just using the word mixtape, throwing it around because they were fearful of calling some shit their album. Now it's like, okay, we're going to get drawn to do a mixtape and it's going to feel like a mixtape. Mm, definitely. Um, it's easy to like get up and hustle every day when you need the money hmm. at a certain point with you. I'm guessing that you don't really need to work that hard. Does it make you move differently? Does it make you split up your time more? Or is this something that you live for to such an extent that it's just what you want to do day in, day out? Bro, I love it so much. Like I, I live, breathe, like die for this culture. Like 
just the fact of what I've been able to accomplish, like literally thinking like truth, like my only goal was to get my name on a flyer and like to think of the things that I've been able to do and accomplish through hip hop and like doing what I love to do. Like it, it, it's, it's my motivation. Like it really keeps me going. Like, and, and the fact of me even like setting a new bar or being at this space of like turning it up a notch, you know what I mean? Like just that opportunity alone is, it is, it, 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 it drives me like it, it, it like I, I'm 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 addicted. I'm not gonna lie. Like, and I have somewhat of an addictive personality, and thankfully, you know, it's a great addiction. But like, mm. I'm addicted to the culture. I'm addicted to putting on and 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 discovering new shit and being a part of new shit and just like you know, really leaving a legacy behind. Like when I when I leave this earth, like I really want people to be like, yo, like Drum did some amazing things for the culture. Mm, that's real. Um, okay. I'm going to hit a little clickbait here. Is Uzi a Satanist? He did. He was on, um, TMZ caught him on Rodeo the other day. Um, and I didn't see the clip, but when I was in the airport, um, I ran into my guy at TMZ and he said he, he, they asked him about that. And his response was no. Um, I basically was saying or describing that i could sell water to a well so in a sense i guess his his definition or the way he wanted to put it was like he was just kind of saying like or putting it out there like you know i can make people or get people to believe whatever i want them to you know right I mean, because I, I grew up. I hope he's not <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. I, I grew up listening to a lot of like metal and stuff too. Yeah, and a lot did, of these I bands. Too. Yeah, the, a lot of these bands will say some shit about Satan. Yeah. and they have a pentagram on their shirt, right. whatever. Like, but Pantera it's an aesthetic. and Megadeth right. and it's, it's like watching a horror movie. A hundred percent. The guy who makes the horror movie is not a serial killer. A hundred percent. He just likes some dark imagery and he wants to make a movie that has a bunch of crazy violent shit going on or whatever. And I couldn't I, agree more. And when I look at Uzi and also Cardi, and Cardi yeah. I am they like, kinda, they like tried to out devil each other at, at Rolling Loud. Yes. And I kind of I appreciate what they're bringing to the game because a lot of people in hip hop have like no familiarity with like metal or right, this right, kind right. of stuff at right, all. Right. So to them this is like very foreign and edgy. Right. And I appreciate them like bringing that kind of energy to the field and making these normal ass people at Rolling Loud have right. to deal with the fact that they've never seen Cardi going ah! or whatever the hell he's doing. Yeah. That's oh definitely your white side talking. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, but I mean Maybe my white side can understand that as well, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with you. You know what I'm saying? I don't think neither of them are at home, like worshiping the devil, or mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you know they're both, you know, uh, believers in God, and you know, don't want to go to hell. Um, I know I don't, mm -hmm. and I'm not you know, someone who advocates or promotes that. Um, Cause I even, when I posted vert on my page from rolling loud, like I got a lot of like, like clearly my fan base is, was not the fan base that was mm -hmm. into that. And um, you know, I was just reading through the comments and everything, but, but I agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm the same way. Like I look at what I do, like being a movie director. So you know, I can get a look. I make gangster grills. Like I'm a I'm a I'm a college kid. Like mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a gangster. You know, I've never I've never sold drugs a day in my life. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I'm not. You know, I'm I'm a real one though for sure. And I keep some real ones around me. But you know, I, because I make gangster grills, I'm also like, you know, I'm a father. I'm fucking. I love to be in the crib and, and watch fucking documentaries and comedies all day. So, um, yeah, I think people sometimes may take things a little too literal or, you know, don't look at it in the frame that, that you just described it. And I, and I think it's somewhat unfair, you know, I mean, and even through time, like, you know, we three, six mafia, like mm. in the name, or, you know, there was a, a time and a space where, 
Uh, we had Grave Diggers. And, you know, I mean, what Uzi's doing may not be for everybody. What Cardi's doing may not be for everybody. But obviously, there's a, a huge fan base that does enjoy it and that does love it. But, you know, I don't think at the end of the day, you know, it means that you have to want to go to hell or be a worst Satan worshiper. Yeah, because from my experience, even... I don't. I don't know. That I ever met anybody who like worships Satan. I know a lot of people who like the aesthetic of it, the imagery of it. They might want to wear a shirt with right. a Satan thing going on or whatever. But the average per like, okay, if you, if you, if you're like a that type of person, you probably don't believe in God. You probably don't believe in the Bible, yeah. and therefore you probably don't even believe that there's anything like heaven or hell yeah. or Satan. Yeah. You know, if I had to guess, if Uzi's like, I don't, I don't know if he believes in God or not, but yeah. the opposite of believing in God is usually just not believing yeah, in God, not like worshiping sat right. Satan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I agree. Um, um, it's kind of a thing in the culture right now, not like the rap culture, but I, I noticed like a very similar thing with Sam Smith. He was like a pop I, performer, and I he saw that. had like a performance wearing all red and like yeah, I saw suit. that at the Grammys. Yep, and I everybody did see that. Was, decided that that was satanic yeah. as well. I mean, you know, and even in hip hop, like there's been a big thing for years just about like the Illuminati and like mm. you know the, the eyes and you know people like different symbols and symbolism and, and I think through time people have played off that. You know what I'm saying? And just like you know, I don't think they're really in the Illuminati, you know, I, or I've never been invited to the meetings for sure, but you <laughs> and know, at this point you probably would have been, yeah, I would think so. I would, I would, I would hope so by this point I would have gotten some type of invitation. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, you know, I just think people need to, you know, take a, take a deep breath, you know, let, let creatives be creatives. And, you know, I mean, again, like ask the man the question and let him answer how he appropriately wants to answer and, you know, give him, give him the, be that, that benefit to, you know, be, have the freedom to express himself the way he wants to. One more clickbait question. Okay. There was a, a thing when Jack Harlow was uh, shooting the video with Drake and they were at the Kentucky Derby or some shit. And there was like a, a photo of a bunch of black security guards. I believe it was carrying him yeah. over the mud. Yeah. And now, like, this is pretty understandable to me that, like, he's shooting a music video. He can't get his shoes dirty. A lot of people, like, felt the need to take issue with the optics of it. I mean, bro, like, what did they want What did they want him to do? Like, get his shoes dirty? Like, <laughs> if, if, I, if I was, I wasn't there at that moment. I don't know where I was, but, shit, I would have suggested as well. Like, hey, like, make sure my man doesn't get his fucking shoes dirty. Like, Right now, he's the golden child of Kentucky. Like, and we're at the Kentucky Derby. We're shooting a video. My man needs to make sure he's clean. So, right. obviously, the optics of the picture was because it was a white man and it was black men around him carrying him that they took such issue with. Um, but, again, that comes along with the territory. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's just the space that, you know, any white person within the culture is gonna have to deal with um when things like that come upon so and i think more importantly it's like how you handle that you know what i'm saying and so like if jack would have jumped out the window and you know said something ignorant back or something i'm like oh no yeah, you know he what never I'm saying? responded yeah it's, probably for the best. it's nothing to respond to mm -hmm. like you know what like come on guys like oh you know, you're just you're just reaching at this point like you're just reaching like if it would have been a uh, uh, a black artist or African American artist of someone of color in the same position, would they have had the problem? You know, so I would I would think not. But at the same time, like I I I get it. You know, I do I I do get it. So I don't want to say that I don't understand where um, some of those feelings and emotions come from, especially when we're talking about something like the Kentucky Derby that, you know, honestly may have some history of racism involved in it. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a historian when it comes to that, but you know, I, I everyone has an opinion and, in this day and time we can see everyone's opinion listen everyone's entitled to their opinion take it how you want but it's like my man didn't need to get his shoes dirty have you had the jack harlow kfc meal 
Uh, yes, I did. I really? did. Yeah. What's special about it? I'm not even sure. Oh man, it's amazing. <laughs> It's fucking amazing. It's like, nah. Just... A lot of those McDonald's <laughs> meals, I, I'm not even sure what the difference is. Like, the, wasn't the, isn't there like a Cardi and Offset one? Yeah, right but now? I, I didn't even. I, I never figured out what the difference. They was. like add like one. Yeah, like it's like extra. It's like the Travis Scott meal, and it'll be like an extra pickle and mustard. Yeah, or yeah something yeah. like that. It's like a little like barbecue sauce yeah. for the fries. It's like you can get the. Bar- you already have barbecue sauce. <laughs> Some shit like that. It's yeah. hilarious. You gotta respect it though. <laughs> DJ Drama, you, you, could you imagine a fast food collab in your future? Oh, that would be fire. Yeah. Um, damn, who could I do it with? Bojangles. Bo, hey, you know, I'm call call <laughs> Coach and P. Yeah. yeah. For sure. You got an in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. All right. Um, yeah, man, anything coming up that we need to be aware of? Well, yeah, the album. I'm really like that. Uh, March 31st, uh, my first studio album in, in about six years. I'm quite excited about, you know, everybody's. I got, got Tyler on the album, Uzi's on the album, Jack's on the album, Wayne, Gucci, 42 Doug, Free Doug, um, uh, Roddy Rich is on there, A Boogie, Little Baby, Mozzie, Saha, La Russell, um, Gucci, Jeezy, mm. Nipsey, rest in peace. Yeah. Blast is on there. G Herbo is on there. Vori's on there. Um, yeah, it's action packed. So right. the you know I'm really like that. I want to make sure everyone definitely goes and checks the album out. I'm super excited. Got a tape with Fabio Foreign dropping. Ooh. Got a got a deluxe coming um, kind of soon. That's going to be pretty dope. Um, Pusha T Gangsta Grills. I got another Gangsta Grills that I just finished. That's definitely gonna shake some shit up. How many people you got helping you with this kind of stuff? I know you said you have a good team and everything, but like it just sounds like a lot of work and a lot of different things to be focusing all at the same time. And it just it sounds like overwhelming to figure out where to point your <laughs> attention at any given time. I mean, I got some good people around me. So I mean, you know, I have we have the Generation Now staff. Mm. Um, my album is on Monarch, so the Monarch staff, you know, uh, and our part our joint ventures with Atlantic. So you know, we have. Uh, help with Atlantic, so um, yeah, I, I definitely have some some great individuals and 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 key components to you know this empire that I have for all, sure amongst me. You like how I uh, I could have done an interview where we told the whole story from the beginning, and I was like, no, I'm gonna like use my time here to actually ask him my questions about him and the industry. So I could just kind of, you know, nah, get as much information I as mean, possible. You're a great interviewer. You know, I'm I'm always tuned in. So, you know, I I have no worries. I appreciate it. Yeah. I figured the Fed case has been oh pretty well God. discussed oh. at this point, right? It's it's like I get it, like, you know, and then it's like there's still people that don't know mm-hmm. about it. So, you know, when I get asked, I just I, I I've come to accept that it's just it's like if you read if you're reading your autobiography, like and it's a chapter in the story, like, I just got to read it. Like, mm. I got it. It's probably like how De La Soul feels about performing Me, Myself, and I. Yeah. Or something like that. Like, you know, I've talked about the raid since it's happened. You know, like, I, I'd be wanting to even tell people, like, yo, just get a sound bite from the thousands of interviews I've done <laughs> and just incorporated here instead of me having to explain. So it was this day and it came with the M16s <laughs> and they arrested me for bootlegging and racketeering. But, you know, it's part of my story. And like, I don't know if I would be here if that wasn't part of my story. So I gotta, I gotta respect it. Yeah. Cause like the same way that all these artists are going to be playing their hit songs for the rest of their lives. <laughs> if you're a public figure, <laughs> You're just signing up to do interviews where they ask you about like the top ten interesting things of your whole life. For sure. So yeah. yeah, you know, I've I'm I'm um I'm savvy enough to, you know, be able to navigate through it and just, you know, when the question comes, I give the answer. Yeah. But it but it's it's like it it hasn't the answer hasn't changed much. Like, you know, the, there's certain things during interviews and during times that like you know, you you might get a different response or, mm. you know, if you look up an interview, I'll have a different hot take on a certain subject. But that is that's going to be what it is for forever. Right. But it's 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 an historical, you know, part of the culture, you know, and it was it definitely was uh, it definitely was something that, you know, it was was bigger than me in a lot of ways. So, you know, I got to I got to like I got to own own it in a way and and i have done for quite some time for sure well hey man it was an honor absolutely my pleasure great man. to get to talk to you Definitely. big inspiration i appreciate and, uh, that yeah let's stay in touch for absolutely sure, let's get it
My man. Yeah. No jumper. DJ drama. I'm really like that. <laughs>